Good morning, good morning. Happy Sabbath and welcome to Sabbath School Study Hour here at the Coco Seventh-day Adventist Church. I trust that we all had a very, very good week so far. Amen. Kip and Sandy. Sandy, but all things considered, amen. <laughs> Dinah Mama's good to see you. Richard's good to see you. Let us have opening prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, for the trying times, for they help to build character. We thank you that through it all, you have seen fit for us to be here for this appointed hour. Forgive us for our sins and be with us, Lord. And we ask that you be the teacher today, Lord Jesus. Help us to see what it is you need for us to see, Lord, so that we can make a decision to allow you to make the reforms necessary in our own lives, Lord so that we can be prepared to meet you in peace when you come, soon and very soon. We thank you for the privilege of prayer and be with those that are watching, Lord, as we are streaming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So opening song is going to be, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Oh, How I Love Jesus, that's hymn number 248. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Jesus, because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free, it tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite. Our, let's see, our scripture reading, I kind of skipped over it, but we'll go back to it. It's taken from Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, verse eight. And um, pretty much the whole lesson will probably center around this, but we'll, we'll break it down nonetheless. The word says, and what nation is there so great that have statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? So that's a very important question that um, that um, that was being asked. And we're going to discuss that somewhat today. Amen. 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 So what a very interesting lesson today. So again, we are continuing. We are now in the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy. So just to kind of recap, as we explored, as you studied already, the first three chapters of Deuteronomy, the children of Israel are reminded in those first three chapters of what they have been through up to that particular point. So as we begin chapter four, Israel is now told by God 
what they should do as a response to what God has done for them. So we understand that, right? The first three chapters um, was kind of recapping what they had been through, how God had, you know, everything that God had done them. So in essence, he was <laughs> telling them in chapter four reasons why they should serve him. Because remember, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so that's what he's saying to us today. That's one thing he's saying to us today as we look back over our own experience because each day our experiences get a little bit more interesting, right? <laughs> Just when you think you've overcome one thing, there's something else. And all of that is done for the perfecting of our characters because ultimately that's what we're going to need in order to see Jesus, right? So what a very, very interesting, interesting lesson. So today's study, Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 through 9, really in essence contains a study on God's law and the consequences of obeying it or rejecting it. In a nutshell. So are we, to get, uh, so are we together so far? Yes. Amen. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Let's move along. So Sunday's lesson, it says what? Do not add or take away. So as we look in Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 and 2, the word says, now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Verse 2 says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it or take away from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So here's the thing. It was God's intention, right? It was God's intention for Israel to be obedient to his law, correct? Which they had promised to do. Because we studied that when we studied the covenant, right? Okay. So why shouldn't we add to or take away from God's word? Why is it not necessary to do that? He doesn't lie. No. Okay, so think about, think about, hi ladies, good morning, happy Sabbath. It's good to see you guys. It was good to see you guys Wednesday. I just didn't get a chance to speak to you and give you a hug. Okay, okay, so, so think about it. So we're talking about the law of God, right? So we are admonished not to add to it or to take away from it. So what is it about the law that makes it unnecessary for us to do that? Okay, so it is a transcript of God's character, right? And God's character is what? It's perfect. He's perfect. So how can an imperfect being take something that's perfect and change it to try to make it more perfect? It's a failure. <laughs> it's a failure. It was, look, it didn't sound right coming out of my mouth. That's just how ridiculous it is. So, so because the law is a transcript of, of his character and it is perfect, it is perfect just the way it is. So we don't need to add to it or take away. So why, why, why do you think Moses was, uh, made it, thought it was necessary to remind them of that? Because they had failed to remember. And okay. He said to remember the Sabbath day, it was important or God would not Remember. Okay, I'm going to read this statement, and then we're going to explore that a little bit more. It was Satan's desire to put forth his propaganda in heaven. Remember, he was in full rebellion against God's law by suggesting that it was imperfect and that it needed to be changed. So Satan has, so has Satan induced the people of God to add new rules to his law? Okay, so, 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 let's, so let's go back for a moment. How do I want to say this? What was, so Israel had a tendency to do something, right? Think about Israel now. So think about what God told them in response to surrounding nations. So when it came to surrounding nations, the heathen nations around them, what was one of God's admonishments to them? They were not to intermarry with them, correct? 
Because what happens when this happens? You usually follow it or at least dilute. Come on, God's Elder. Law. Preach that, Elder. You usually dilute God's law with man's law. Yes, so now you have a mixture of something, right? So what Israel had a tendency to do, young ladies, was that God had wanted them to be, well, they were a chosen people, and we'll discuss that a, a little bit more. So it was nothing inherent about them that made them such except for the fact that God had chose them. They were slaves. Some of us can um, relate to that because some, some of us have ancestors physically that were slaves, but we're all slaves to sin at one time and point. So God had chosen Israel, so, but he told Israel that he did not want them to intermarry with the surrounding nations because Israel were worshipers of the true God, but the surrounding nations were typically steeped in idolatry, worshiping idols and these type things. So God did not want them to marry into these heathen families because what happens is this right here, because the Lord tells us in the word that to be ye not unequally yoked up together with unbelievers. So if I'm a believer, if I'm a Christian, Seventh-day Adventist, then that's what I need to be marrying. Now, he can be a Christian, Seventh-day Adventist, and we can still be unequally yoked. But the point is, believers were not to marry unbelievers, but Israel had a problem. She always would disobey God and then take on the gods. When they intermarry into these heathen nations or these families, they tend to not worship God anymore, and they take on the worship styles of these heathen nations. And so God did not want them to do that, and he don't want us to do that as spiritual Israel, and we'll talk about that. So are we clear on that so far? Okay, so you, what, what you said, Elder, was true. There tends to be a mixing of things. And what is this mixture? Well, we talk about compromise. Compromise? In marriage, you're supposed to compromise, but this is not correct in this regard. Okay, so what happens is when you mix truth with error, or when, you, when they mix in pagan customs, they, it, it, it tended to invent new laws and it established new traditions. And it becomes Trevor. Yes. Yeah, the mixing truth and error. Trevor. I like that. I'm going to get a shirt that says, I do not believe in Trevor. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so let's look at an example of that because there's an example. Now, this wasn't in your lesson, but this was just my own extra because I, I, I think that it brings it out. And I wanted to spend a little bit more time in this particular section because I wanted to drive home a point. So go, um, go to 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 33. 2 Kings, we're studying God's word here. 2 Kings 17, verse 33. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of nations whom they carried away from the Yes, 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 that's it. So we're going to, so, so in other words, let's get some context, right? Because remember I told you last week in order to understand the content, we need to understand the context. So if you go back to chapter, I mean, verse 24, all the way through 33, there was something that was, that was happening there. And just for the sake of time, I'm just going to read my note and you guys can go back in your spare time. So God's people began to worship the gods of the Samaritans. So if I start at verse 28, which says, Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Okay, because they were starting to take on the customs of the Samaritans. How be it? It says every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. It says, and the men of Babylon made Succoth Benoth, that was a god, and the men of Cuth made Nergo, and the men of Hamath made Ashima. So these were gods, right? It says, and then the Avites made Nibha and Tartak and the Seraphites, it said, burnt their children in the fire to Adramalek and Amamalek. The, uh, so in other words, what they, what they did so if you look at 33, it said they feared the Lord and served their own God. So let me ask you something, baby girl. How can you fear God or respect God 
and then do your own thing at the same time. You can't. So what it is telling us here is that they had mixed the worship of God with the worship of the Samaritans. And you will get that um, from verse 24 through to 33. So what was the result of that? Apostasy. Apostasy, yes. It says because they had mixed the worship of God with the worship of false gods. And so what happens is they disregarded God's commandment. So what does Exodus 20 verses, what is it, 4 and 5? What does it tell us? That we are not to, to, to make unto the any graven images, and we're not to worship them, and we're not to bow down unto them. So here we see they had disregard. So this is what happens when we compromise and when we mix truth with error. So it was something very interesting that Ellen White said as it relates to tr mixing truth with error. Good morning, Elder. How are you feeling today? Okay. Wait a minute. Note from the Bible, number one. Okay. She said the destruction that befell the northern kingdom was a direct judgment from heaven. The Assyrians were merely the instrument that God used to carry out his purpose. Through Isaiah, who began to prophesy shortly before the fall of Samaria, the Lord referred to the Assyrian host as the rod of his anger. Grievously had the children of Israel sinned against the Lord God, and they wrought wicked things. She said they would not hear, but they rejected his statutes because, because remember, the Lord never ever stops trying to save us. He always sends us warning. He always points us back. He sends somebody with a big mouth like mine to say, listen, you don't have to know it all, but just read what's already in the word and encourage them to turn from their ways. So word was sent to the people so that they could turn from their ways. As you read the, the rest of the chapter, the, from the beginning of chapter 17, and you will see that they had rejected it. He said they rejected his statutes and his covenants that he made with their fathers. It was because they had left all the commandments of the Lord and made a grove and they worshiped all the host of heaven and they served Baal and they refused steadfastly to repent. They refused to repent. And so we cannot mix truth with error. We're going to move on because we're going to see another story. As if this wasn't bad enough, right? We're talking about adding to or taken away from God, so we cannot do either. And we'll see if there's a text in Revelation that tells us that we're not to do that, especially for our time. So turn to 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 33. 1 Kings 12, 33. These are examples of what not to do, saints. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the 8th month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. Okay. And ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. And burnt incense. Okay. So what is the context of that? So in your leisure, read um, 1 Kings 12, verses 1 through 33. A very interesting story about a young man named Jeroboam. So what did Jeroboam do? I'm glad you asked. Jeroboam was placed on the throne by the ten tribes who rebelled against the house of God. And you should read the history. It was about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You had Judah and you had Jerusalem. And so Jeroboam used to be the former servant of Solomon. And he was in a, so, 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 so he knew what God required because he was trained of Solomon. And he was in a very, very good position to bring about wise reforms. So leaders, we have to be careful. If God put us in positions, allow us to be in positions, we have to be careful about what comes out of here. Because if it ain't coming out of here, it shouldn't come out of here. We have to be careful about that. And it goes on to say that he had once showed an aptitude and sound judgment. So here's somebody who was a good guy. He was trained to Solomon, who was the wisest man to ever live. But something happened to him. He had showed sound judgment, 
But the one thing he failed to do is he failed to make God his trust. So we can have all the talents and gifts in the world, gift to, whatever it is that we have, but if we, and, and those things are good because every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord, but we have to be so careful to make God number one. It doesn't matter how well we can sing or how well we can play instruments or how well we can speak or how well we can do anything. Because the Lord gave you that gift, we need to return it back unto him so that it may be used for his name's honor and glory. And so Jeroboam didn't do that. And why didn't he do that? Fascinating story. You all should read that and then read it in Prophets and Kings. Basically, he was afraid that if the ten tribes were permitted or allowed to visit often the services at the Temple of Jerusalem, because what was happening is you have the ten tribes whom Jeroboam was over, right? And so the people, the ten tribes would travel to Jerusalem because, the, because they still um, um, have the temple services, right? So Jeroboam got afraid that if they continued to go to Jerusalem, that they would somehow rebel against him. So what did he do? So he decided that he was going to set up his own worship, okay? Jeroboam going to do his own thing, right, Elder Wood? So what did he do? He set up not one but two centers of worship, did he not? He set up one in Dan, which was one of the lost tribes, by the way. Interesting story. And then he set up another center in Bethel. And to make things even worse, this boy set up two golden calves because he wanted to give them a visual representation of God. Now, where do we see that failing? Around the, uh, Exodus. <laughs> so they didn't learn nothing from what happened, did they? When Aaron made that golden, so here it is, Jeroboam takes it a step further, so he sets up two. And this is the lesson for us and why this is so very dangerous. We have to be so very, because we're talking about revival and we want to build this church up and I'm all for that. But we have to be very, very careful because Jeroboam introduced some things into the worship for the sake of getting people to come to church. Does that make sense? Yes. But the things that he introduced, <laughs> no, no. No. And so the consequences, the consequences were, were deadly. So what is the end time? Oh, I'm going to read this. Let's see. Read number two from my Bible, okay? Number two. Okay. Well, for what, from what page, dear? <laughs> okay. I think, let me see. Oh, okay. Just bear with me. Number two, because I have to label them right, because if I don't label them, I won't know where I am. Okay, basically what she was saying, she was talking about um, mixing, mixing truth with error and how we shouldn't mix truth with error. Um, that was taken from the Review and Herald, January, I think, 1889. So basically that whole thing was saying how detrimental it is because she was saying that error kind of kind of kind of gets its teeth from truth. This is why people are led into the error because there's truth in it. But she was saying that nothing of God, you know, you can't mix the holy with the with the with with the profane and that we have to do what God say do. So now we we see Jeroboam's example is he led the people into idol worship. And we have to be so careful because Ellen White wrote a chapter in The Great Controversy entitled Modern Revivals. And she talks about the types of revivals that'll be breaking out all over the place, even among us, and that we have to be careful that we're not introducing things or allowing things to take place simply for the sake of filling these pews. That is not what God called us to do. We cannot do that, Elder. Over there or 
Yes, they were still, because they still had um, temple services. Yes, yeah, they were still having true worship. And so that's what, and look, this boy took it a step further. So God has said that the priests were to be from the tribe of Levi, right? Course, yeah. So this guy, he gonna appoint his own priest. Yes, they, oh yeah, that's right. He appoints his, <laughs> so he, so he changed the game up when it came to worship. But that's not what the Lord instructed because by erecting those two calves, they broke one of the commandments. And we have to be clear on what these commandments are and why God gave them to us. Because it's a transcript of his character. They point out what sin is and, and, and it is the standard by which we will be judged. Because judgment is going on now, right? Is it not? The first angel's message. So that's the standard by which we're going to be judged. And so that was the standard that God has set for his seat. As a church, we don't have to come up with a standard, Mr. Jim. We don't. The Lord has already given us a standard. We just have to uphold the standard God has already given us. Yes. It's not necessary following the schedules and the laws of God. God wants you to raise your goodness up to the point where you are here to what he has said. Yes, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about doing his will and, um, and, and um, as, it, as it relates to um, the fourth chapter. So Monday's lesson, Baal Peor. Oh, my goodness. Yes, sure I like stories. stories. Have wide implications and could last a long time. So I, <laughs> yeah, okay. But there is a pastor, uh, Walter Vaught. Love him. And he has recently come out with uh, some studies. And he was talking about, like in the 70s, when um, he was starting his evangelistic crusades. He was an atheist, he was a Catholic, and, yes. and then he found the Adventist church and he says, right. do I have to do all these crazy things? But then he tried to use those same things studied in Ellen White with his anatomy classes. Uh -huh. They were raising sheep and he that Ellen was right. Uh huh. So then he kept proving, but not in, in against her, but in favor of her. Yes. So it turns out that he started this evangelistic group, and he was going to give these uh, this uh, campaign, as he says, and the and it was in Germany, and. It was his mother tongue. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is uh, the president of the division called him in okay. and said, please do not say anything about uh, the Pope being the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And so he said, tell me about this. So he went through and told him. And so he said, it's very interesting that uh, when I, uh, oh, he said, there are things that the Adventist Church no longer teaches. Ooh. And, and, mm -hmm. and so he says, tell me about that. And so it turns out, he said, when I took my baptismal vows, Ellen White was included. And, and so I must talk about that. And the second thing is that the Pope is the Antichrist. So I am going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so it's so interesting that today we have leadership who constantly say that we cannot, I mean, those, those things that have been the harbinger of Seventh-day Adventism mm -hmm. are no longer because that was 18, uh, the 19th century uh, speak for what is really going on. And we'll talk about that because 
um, that um, as we read through chapter 4, 1 through 9, is something in here, something interesting that happened um, at Bel Peor. And we will talk about that very thing. Thank you so very much. I love Walter Vite. Okay, so Bel Peor. My, my, my. Oh, my goodness. So Deuteronomy. So again, verses um, 3 and 4. Now, remember, Moses is still going through and he's still reminding them of some things. And remember, he's admonishing them to keep God's law. And there's a reason why, because they were right on the precipice of the promised land. And he was trying to encourage them to continue to be true because we had just discussed they had the habit of taking on the gods and stuff of the land and the nation surrounding them. So, so it was very, very in interesting. So, um, verses, so verse 3 said, Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, he said, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you, but ye that did cleave unto God, cleave unto the Lord your God, are alive every one of you this day. And we're going to talk about that. So what happened at Baal Peor? Somebody turn to Numbers 25, 1 through 15. So just off the top of your head, what happened at Baal Peor? Give a little bit more detail. See, it's important, remember, to understand the context. So, anybody else? What happened at Bel Peor? What happened at Bel Peor? Okay. Uh, okay, all right. So, turn to, let's turn to Numbers, because we're studying the Bible. So, let's turn to Numbers 25, 1 through 4. 25, 1 through 15. So how about we just read that, okay? Because it's important for us. Numbers 25, verses 1 through 15. Okay, do we have it? Yes. It says, And Israel abode in Shittim, which was the land of Acacia, the land of the Acacia tree. That's, that's where they were. He says, And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab interesting story. It says, and they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. So we, now we're talking about Israel. It says, um, and Israel joined herself, joined himself, I should say, unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord might be turned away from Israel. And Moses, huh? Okay, it says, and Moses said unto the judges of Israel, slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children... No, 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 numbers. Numbers 25, 1 through 15. It says, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses. He was bold. It says, And in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. It says, And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. He rose up from among the congregation, and he took a javelin in his hand. This is how God told him to deal with it. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through the belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. 
And those that died in the plague were 24,000. So because of rebellion, 24,000 people lost their lives because of their decision. It says, and the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, have turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake among them that I consume not the children of Israel. Wherefore say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace and he shall have it and his seed after him. It says, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. It says, now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianite woman was Zimri. So Zimri was a leader. It says, the son of Salu, a prince of the chief house among the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman that was slain, her name was Cosby, the daughter of Zor. And he was the head. Huh? No, I'm going to explain that in a moment. I'm going to get to it. Listen, it's important that we understand the context because we can just read a scripture, a text of scripture and not understand. We need to understand the context of it so we can understand what it is God is really trying to say to us because this has a dual application for us. Because remember, this, this, this quarterly is talking about present truth in Deuteronomy. Okay, so we need to be able to make an end time application to this. So, so, so here it is. The scripture tells us that the people of God were in the Valley of Shittim. This is where they had encamped. So if you remember the story, right? So Balak wanted Balaam to curse the people of God, right? But he could not do it, right? Is that true? He could not do it. He tried, so... So in essence, so in essence, he told Balak, oh, just invite them to a worship service. Because in order to get them to fall, you have to get them to sin against their God. Well, you know, he knew that he could not curse the people of God. He did, yes. He even offered some fun sure. that he really, really sure. wanted to get his hands on. Sure. So he would prolong this thing until he get his hands on the fun. Sure. Knowing that he was Exactly, but what he suggested was successful. Yes. He said, in essence, Sister Paulette, invite him to a worship service. <laughs> invite him to a concert. You know that they would fall for the women, huh? Go ahead, and then I'll read. But both these stories here, Balaam, this one, they were enticed by women. Yes, yes. and we're going to read that. We're going to get to that. <laughs> yes. So here is what um, this chapter is entitled, um, Apostasy at the Jordan, okay? So here's the light that, sh that Mrs. White sheds on Numbers 25, 1 through 15. She said, the veil of Shittim, it was here that the Israelites encamped in the Arcasia groves by the riverside, they found an agreeable retreat. But amid these attractive surroundings, they were to encounter an evil more deadly than mighty hosts of armed men and wild beasts. Yeah. She said that country that was so rich in natural advantages had been defiled by the inhabitants in the public worship of Baal, okay, the, who was the leading deity. He said the most degrading and iniquitous scenes were constantly enacted. Those are strong words. Yes, it, exactly. So it says on every side were places noted for idolatry and licentiousness. The very names being suggestive of vileness and corruption of the people. We have to be careful about our associations. Who we associate with and who we allow our children to associate with. He says these surroundings exerted a polluting influence upon the Israelites. Their minds became familiar with the vile thoughts that were constantly suggested. Their life of ease, and here's the thing, their life of ease and inaction produced its demoralizing effect. And almost unconsciously to themselves, they were departing from God and coming into a condition where they will fall an easy prey to temptation. Online, 
Yes, that's why as children of God, we cannot be inactive. We can't just sit and do nothing. The Lord has blessed this church with so much knowledge. I mean, really, he has given us a command, but we like the ease and the comfort of things. We don't want to step outside of our comfort zone. But, but what she's telling us is that their life of ease and inactivity led to their temptation. So it said, yes. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's in the notes. <laughs> I'm with you, Elder. I'm with you. We'll get to that. Just bear with me. Yes. So she goes on to say, at first there was little intercourse between the Israelites and their heathen neighbors. It says, but after a time, those beautiful, fine, good-looking Midianite women began to steal into the camp. Their appearance excited no alarm. And so quietly was their plans conducted that the attention of Moses was not even called to the matter. It was the object of these women in their association with the Hebrews. Now, what did we just talk about when we first started? Don't take away and don't add. We're, be ye not unequally yoked up together with unbelievers. That's what happened. He said that in their association with the Hebrews, talking about the women, they seduced them into transgression of the law of God to draw their attention to heathen rites and customs and to lead them into idolatry. Their motives were so studiously concealed under the garb of friendship so that they were not suspected, not even by the guardians of God's people. So at Balaam's suggestion, a grand festival in honor of their gods was appointed by the king of Moab, and it was secretly arranged that Balaam should induce the Israelites to attend. Both of those stories is in the teacher's edition, not in the... It's not even in the teacher's edition. This is my own. Okay, I mean, Bel Peor is, yeah. So it goes on to say that the Israelites were beguiled with music and dancing and the allure of the beauty of these heathen women that they cast off there, felt it to Jehovah, and they united in the myrrh and the, fest and, and the festivities until their senses were beclouded. They were benumbed with wine. And so their senses were broken down and they lost all self-control. Passion gave full sway and they defiled their consciousness with lewdness and they, and, and, and they were persuaded to bow down to idols. So after all that, so what ultimately, so what do you think the consequences of it? A terrible pestilence broke out in the camp to which tens of thousands speedily fell prey. God commanded that the leaders in this apostasy be put to death. It said this order was promptly obeyed. The offenders were slain and their bodies were hung up in the sight of all Israel so that the congregation, seeing their leaders who were so severely dealt with, might have a deep sense of God's abhorrence of sin. And will choose not to not to sin. So here, so I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I hate to bring this up, but it seems as if that somehow women has been leading men <laughs> from Adam and Eve. Huh? Yeah. Well, what I will say to that as as a woman, what I will say to that, Eve was deceived. Adam sinned. It says, we all sin because of Adam. <laughs> I got you. So, so the point, so... So the point I was making is that as we look at what happened to Bel Peor, when we look at how God's people, now keep this in mind, they were on the very precipice of the promised land, which is Canaan, okay? And 24,000 of them fell into apostasy. They were right on the precipice of it. Twenty-four thousand of them, yes. But, but look, let me tell you about Zimri, right? So Zimri held a high position among God. See, he was so bold until he paraded the woman. <laughs> Y'all should read the, read the story. He was so bold 
and he just took her right on into his tent like it was nothing. And Eleazar went in and he yes. did what he did. So, so spiritual Israel, so what can we draw from that? Listen, we are on the very precipice of heavenly Canaan. We can't, okay, hold on, Elder, it's okay. We're going to get there. We cannot, I mean, because I got to give you what God gave to me to give to you. Okay, all right, I have to be obedient, okay? We're on the very precipice. <laughs> We're on the very precipice of the heavenly Canaan, right? We're on the very borders, right? And so, as God's people in these last days, Mr. Rumsey, we cannot afford to fall into apostasy. Does that make sense? Do we agree with that? We have, but not all of us. Because remember, when we get to the day where Tuesday where it's talking about cleaving to your God. So this is what happened. So this is a lesson for us. We have to be careful. Let's study what happened with Belpior so that we don't fall into that same trap. Because remember, these things have dual application. So what does it mean to cleave unto your God? So now if you continue to study the whole Belpior scenario, we see that some people lost their lives, but then it was those who, who cleaved unto their God who was spared. So what does it mean to cleave unto God? What does that mean? Okay. What does it mean to cleave unto your God? What does it mean? What does the word cleave mean? It, 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 it comes from the same root word as when... Um, when God performed the first marriage and he said that you shall now leave your mother and father and you shall cleave unto your soul. That word cleave, it comes from the same root word. So what does the word cleave mean? To hang on. To become one. So what does the word cleave suggest? It suggests something. If you look at it in terms of a marriage, what is a marriage? A marriage is the most intimate, close, most intimate relationship two human beings can have. And so God often likens his relationship with us to him in terms of a marriage. So it makes sense where it said that they cleaved unto their God. So the word cleave, it stands for the closest possible relationship. So let us think about that for a moment. We all got ideas running around now. Hey, come up we're trying to see where you're going. Okay, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So it was so so in order to cleave unto God, to hold on to God in these trying times, what has to happen? Yes, we have to have our minds made up. You guys are looking at me like, what is she talking about? Listen, we have to make our minds up. We have to be fully persuaded. These people, even in the midst of what was happening in Belpior, God still had a people in the midst of the foolishness. He had a people who had made their minds up that come what may, I'm serving the Lord. And when those 24,000 lost their lives and Zimri lost his in the worst way, a javelin, God, and then their bodies was hung up. The Lord was trying to say something to the leadership. He's trying to say something to the leadership. We have an awesome, a grand and awful, I don't know if there's a such thing as grand and awful, responsibility. So that's what he's trying to show us in this time as we're on the very borders of heavenly Canaan. This is what, so we have to make a decision. Their minds were made up. And our minds have to be made up, Mama, that we are going to believe God and hold on to him. Be because we're going to see all kind of stuff happen in these last days. Wednesday said, for what nation is there? So now, are there any questions? Any comments? I'm doing a little quick comment. Excuse me? I'm doing a little quick comment. Okay. Yes. Yes. Somebody read, because um, we're still talking about um, choosing to remain faithful. 
What does Jude 24 tell us? Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless. So in other words, in order for that to happen, if you read that whole chapter of Jude, it's taking you through steps in a spiritual experience. And so in order for God to, prevent, to present us faultless, our minds have to be made up. We cannot fall for the apostasies and the things that we're going to see around us. Even these things are going on around us. We can still be faithful. There's no excuse for us not to be faithful. The Lord has given us too many examples. Um, somebody read 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and 14. Somebody read that. Elder Wolf wanted me to get to it. 1 Corinthians 13, um, 10, um, verses 13 and 14. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as a wise man. Judge ye what I say. So what is the Lord saying to us today? Because remember, we're making an end time application that we are to flee from idolatry. Meaning we can't be associated with anything that's idolatrous in these last days because we're liable to see anything. And we have to make our minds up. So that's all it is saying that when, that when we purpose in our heart, the, you know, God is faithful. He will protect us. He will take care of us. But our minds have to be made up. The Bible says for a double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. Long. So God has already made a way of escape for us from any temptation. He has, but we have to make our minds up that we're going to flee from that temptation. That we're going to flee from these things that, that we shouldn't um, do. Long. Okay. Okay. I think that is in my note. Okay, so you brought it up. I'm not going to read it from my note. So what are some of these idolatries, idolatrous practices that we need to turn from? <laughs> well, yeah, just... Okay. Anything that takes the place of God. Anything that takes the place of God. So just look at, I've had this, um, this lady, she did an AY program. I was about 15, 16 years old. And she said, if you want to know what it is that you're really worshiping, look at your day, Claudette, and look at what you spend most of your time doing. That thing that you spend most of your time doing might just be an idol. Okay? Okay. All right. So, we're, so the question, we're almost, huh? I'm sorry. Yes, he does. Yes, I think we've talked. Yes, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. Okay, so we made it to Wednesday. So now we see, so is there any questions so far? Okay. Wednesday's lesson. So we get to the question, for what nation is there so great? So let me ask you this question. What makes a nation great? What makes a nation great? You see, you got ahead of the lesson. That's okay. That's okay. Just, just a nation, because we're going to talk about what made them. There's a point that I'm, I always have points, I think. It's important for me to connect the dots, because I want to connect them to the point that when you leave here, you fully understand what was said. That's why I take time, and I know some say she does the most with her details, but 
there's a blessing in the details because we can just sit and just go day by day and y'all can walk out of here and don't understand anything. But I want to connect the dots so that you can understand. So what makes a nation, just any nation, America, what makes a nation great? Just a nation. Yes. If we just listen, go home and not do nothing, we need to go verify it and make sure what you said is in the Bible. Okay. So what tip it so I'm gonna help you 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 guys out I got nine minutes. Okay. What else makes a nation great? It's leadership, it's laws. Usually when you talk about a nation great, it is because of their military prowess. It is usually because of their laws, their statutes. It is usually because of what else? Their economy. These are all the things that tend to make a nation great. Just look at what makes America great. So now, for, so in scripture for Moses to ask the question, for what nation is there so great? As he's talking about Israel. Now Israel didn't have any of those things. But what made her great? Their, yes, their success as a nation. And why they were great was dependent upon their obedience to God's law. That's what made them great. Because remember, they were a people, I mean, they were, I mean, slaves. And God wrought wonderfully for them. And they were a great nation because he said they were. What did I say last week? When God speaks. So here it is. He's asking the question, and why do you think Moses is constantly reminding them of this. We're studying Deuteronomy, the, the chapter, four, um, chapter 4. I have a question. Go ahead. Is, is the commandments and the statutes and the judgments all the same, or are they all the same? Somebody answer that question for her. She, she asked the question, are commandments, statutes, and judgments the same? Somebody else. Yes, no, maybe. So here's the thing. Statutes, okay, laws and statutes normally govern, um, govern a people. The statutes typically govern civility or things that happen as it relates to civil law. And judgments are typically... Um, in actions for not keeping with the law and the statutes. Does that make sense? So the Lord gave them law. He gave them the commandments. He gave them statutes. They knew civil, how they were to live among other nations. And then he gave them judgments. He showed them what happens when you disobey the first two. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Is it clear as mud? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the early part of this country, when it was great, uh, when she was lamb, when she's still and lamb, right? Like. It says, uh, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay. Uh, to be carnally minded is death. Okay. So maintaining the spirituality will maintain your greatness. Lose that, you're, you're down. Yes. That's what I said. Yes. Yes, that's what you said. Yes. Yes, you're both saying the same thing. <laughs> that's okay. Why did God raise up Israel? To be a light. To whom? To the world. To be a light. So who were they were to testify of? God. And so they failed miserably, right? They failed miserably. And this is Wednesday's lesson. We're going into Thursday. I will have you out of here in five minutes, I promise. They failed miserably because they broke his commandments. Mixing truth with error. We already discussed that before some of y'all came in here. Mixing truth with error. So now what lesson is that for us as spiritual Israel, because remember I told you at the beginning, this lesson talking about present truth in, in Deuteronomy. So everything that's in this lessons have an application for us in these last days. So what is that saying to us? What for what purpose has God called us into being? That we should be a light to the world. 
Okay. And what else? Lots of reasons, but some very important reasons. Come on, you Bible scholars. Yes, to keep the commandments. Okay. What else? Specifically, yes, because the lesson did ask in the teacher's lesson as it relates to Seventh day Adventists, because we're all Seventh day Adventists in here, right? To demonstrate the love of God. Okay. For what re okay, yeah, we are to do this. So for what reason did he raise up this movement? Judgment has come. Okay, judgment has come as what? And, and that is what? Jesus. Thank you. That's the movement. So the Lord raised us up specifically because Israel were to do the same thing. They were to lead the surrounding nations to a knowledge of God. Okay? But they couldn't do that because we can't speak against what you're part of. Just saying. So we were raised up to give a specific message. The final warning message, which is the three angels' messages. And there's another reason. There's a, um, another reason. Bible scholars, come on. So it's another reason. To call out the man of sin. To call out, oh, for you, okay. To call out the man of sin. Yo, do know that that's part of our mission, right? I know we don't want to talk about that, but I have to be obedient because I may not be here tomorrow, so I got to tell you the truth today, and we should do that. So the Lord has, spiritual Israel, has put us here for a particular reason. And everything you said is true. We ought to do those things. We ought to live by precept and example, and to go ye therefore and teach all nations and baptizing them. But, we, but the Lord has entrusted us with the final warning message for this time, which is, as Dwayne pointed out, he quoted the first angel, but it's the three angels' message, and particularly the third angel. And we ought to expose the man of sin. Because remember, it's not the people. It is a false religious system that God needs somebody to be brave enough in this church to stand up and say it. In love, of course, but you have to say it. Yes, and that's the first angel's message is to call us back to fear and to reverence and to worship God, calling us back to the worship of the creator God, worship him that made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and, the, and to remember. Yes, yeah, so, so God wants us to call people's attention back to that. Thursday's lesson um, is talking about our wisdom, okay, and then we'll be done here. So... I'm just going to read my notes. So the respect of Israel among the surrounding nations would be proportional to their faithfulness in observing the commandments of God. The blessings of God upon his people as they live in harmony with his requirements would greatly impress the surrounding nations. So, so, so their wisdom, as you said before, you just didn't use that word wisdom, but their word wisdom is in their being obedient to what the Lord has said for them to do. And us as a people in these last days, that's our wisdom. This church has everything it needs. We don't have to go searching for anything. God, um, I was at Brother Rumsey's house last week, and we were discussing, just talking about God like we always do, having a great conversation. And I made the statement. I said, God has thought of everything. And Mrs. Rumsey said something that was simple but profound. She says, of course he did because he knows everything. And so he has thought of everything and everything we need he has given us. So let us be faithful to the charge that he has given us, spiritual Israel. Let us learn. Go back and go back through this lesson. Read Prophets and Kings and read, um, read um, pa pa Patriarchs and Prophets as it relates to this lesson. Because she brings out in the Bible commentary on the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4, she brings out so much in that. And the Lord wants us to be intelligent in his word, does he not? And he doesn't want us to fall into the same traps as ancient Israel. He has a plan for us, saints. And um, we have to be willing to do all that we can 
by his strength to do the things that he wants us to do. Even if you're the only person standing for the truth, stand anyhow. After you've done all you can, Shirley, you just stand, right? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for the lesson. We're thankful, Lord, for the experiences of Bel Peor. Lord, we're thankful for the story you showed us about Jeroboam and how we are not to, just for the sake of building up our church, start introducing things, false worship and things into our church just so that we can build up this church. Thank you for that story, Lord. And press upon the hearts of the people to go back and to read the stuff and to study it, Lord, because they have to make an individual decision because when things really get bad, Lord, we're not going to be saved corporately, Heavenly Father. We have to make a decision. Our minds have to be made up. Help your people to understand that, Lord, so that they can be saved when you come in your kingdom soon and very soon. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Closing song, let us stand. Closing song. Closing song is number 524. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Who else are we going to trust in, right? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. 524. We're going to do the first and the fourth, okay? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know the said the Lord Jesus, Jesus how I trust him, how I prove him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust. Verse 4. Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that thou art with me, will be with me till the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, Heavenly Father, continue to be with us throughout the next portion of our service. Lord, we ask that you allow us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to remember that this is the Sabbath, holy unto you, and that the ground upon which we stand is holy. Help us to curb our conversations, Lord, and to remember that we're in the very presence of a holy God. In Jesus' name, amen.